So we come this morning to Acts chapter 2 once again. This is a monumental moment in redemptive history. I think this is an amazing portion of Scripture, and we want to treasure it as such. We want to bask in the long-awaited, much-anticipated moment that the day of Pentecost was. And yet at the same time, due to a kind of terminological hijacking, we have to address unwarranted interpretations and applications that have been impressed upon the beautiful day of Pentecost. With that said, today we will be giving attention to what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is and what it is not. What the filling of the Holy Spirit is, what the day of Pentecost is meant to teach us, and what the day of Pentecost is not meant to teach us. That will be the focus of our study today. Now, a few weeks ago, we saw that the day of Pentecost occurred on the day of Pentecost. I say it that way because for many New Testament Christians, we may come to the text and we may think that Pentecost is just a New Testament event without knowing its Old Testament backdrop. And for that backdrop, and for the amazing typological fulfillment of those Jewish spring feasts, I would greatly encourage you to listen to the message from a few weeks ago, the significance and symbolism of Pentecost. So they were there about 120 in this upper room. There they are. It's 10 days after the ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. They are there together. They're waiting in the upper room where they had been gathered when suddenly from heaven there comes a sound as of a mighty rushing wind and it fills the whole house where they are gathered. Now again, a few weeks ago, I spoke about the significance of wind and the symbolism connected with wind and the Holy Spirit. You remember that the Hebrew word ruach, or the Greek word, Koinonia Greek word pneuma, both can be translated as spirit, breath, or wind. So there's a linguistic connection between wind and the Holy Spirit. And then when you go through the scriptures, whether it's Ezekiel 37, you could see the power of the Holy Spirit connoted there, depicted in the wind that applied the word of the prophet Ezekiel to the dry bones to bring them to life. Or you could look in John chapter 3, where Jesus taught that the Spirit's ministry was like the wind. Like the wind, as, as it blows wherever it wishes, so is everyone who is born of the Holy Spirit. So there is a symbolic connection between wind and and the Holy Spirit. So the first sign, if you will, on the day of Pentecost was the sound as of a mighty rushing wind. Next, if you look in verse 3, we were told that there appeared to them divided tongues as a fire, and one sat upon each of them. Which warrants the question, what did the fire symbolize? And again, a few weeks ago, we considered that when you look at the Old Testament, you can see numerous occasions that connect fire and the presence of God. You think of Genesis 15, where Abraham had prepared the sacrifices, and then the Lord's presence as a flaming torch passed through the sacrifices as he made that unilateral covenant with Abraham. You think of Exodus chapter 3, the burning bush. You think of Mount Sinai and the fire there. You think of God leading Israel through the fire by night and so on. Fire was connected with the presence of God. In some sense, it was a manifestation of his gracious presence. Doubtless, it is a manifestation of his holy presence. To use language from Hebrews 12, 29, our God is a consuming fire. Now, one of the things that you don't want to miss, one of the most important takeaways, if you're going to understand what's going on in Pentecost, and if you want to see it rightly, you do not want to miss one of the most important takeaways that you see already in verse 3 of chapter 2. You'll notice that divided tongues as of fire sat upon each of them. This was a visible sign that the presence of God, the Spirit of God, had come to rest upon each of the believers. More about that as we go on. Now you'll note, if you were to read on in Acts chapter 2, you would note that a little bit later on, the Jewish crowd will be perplexed by the miraculous work of God as the 120 spoke in languages that were foreign to them and native to the Jews who were gathered in Jerusalem at that time. 
but they were perplexed. They're, they're wondering, they're amazed, how is this happening? And they were asking, what could this mean? Acts chapter 2, verse 12. And then shortly after that, Peter will stand up. And at the beginning of his words, right around the beginning, he will say, this is what was spoken of by the prophet Joel. That God was pouring out his spirit on all flesh, i.e. all of his covenant people, whether they were young or old, whether they were male or female, whether they were sons or daughters, maid servants or men servants. God was pouring out his spirit upon all of his covenant people. This is it. This is the moment that they were waiting for. This is the moment in redemptive history where no longer would the Holy Spirit come upon a certain individual for a certain amount of time to simply achieve a certain task. Think of Samson being empowered by the Holy Spirit to begin to deliver Israel from the Philistines. Or Old Testament kings who were empowered by the Holy Spirit to lead. Or certain artisans who were empowered to do the craftsmanship needed for the work of the tabernacle. Now the Holy Spirit would be poured out on all of God's covenant people. There would be no haves and have nots. This is one of the beautiful points of Pentecost. So, contrary to Pentecostalism, that teaches that there are those who have been baptized with the Holy Spirit and they are the ones who are really empowered for ministry. And that there are others, ordinary Christians, who have some empowerment, but not nearly as much empowerment as they could have if they had a particular experience. The day of Pentecost was meant to communicate that God's Spirit was being poured out on all of His people. On the day of Pentecost, God was not creating an A team and a B team. He was not creating a varsity team and a JV team. If you think that's what's going on at Pentecost, that God is now empowering a certain sect of Christians and then leaving other ones lacking because they don't want empowerment enough, then you've missed a primary point of Pentecost. A primary point of Pentecost is this is what the prophet Joel said. This is what he prophesied. God's spirit poured out upon all of his covenant people. All of his covenant people. More about that soon enough. But then there was a third Pentecost sign. See, there was a sound as of a mighty rushing wind. There were tongues of fire that rested upon each one of the disciples who were there. And then there was a third, a third sign on this Pentecost moment. We see that as we look at Acts chapter 2, verse 4, where we read, And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now to begin to understand what's happening here, let's rewind briefly. Jesus had told his disciples shortly before he ascended into heaven that not many days from his ascension into heaven, not many days from then, they would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Acts chapter 1, verse 5. So with that being said, we do well to ask the question, okay, what is then the baptism of the Holy Spirit? How would we begin to define this or understand this in light of Jesus' words there and in light of what we see in the rest of the New Testament? Well, Jesus said what he said in Acts chapter 1, verse 5, so we know that the baptism of the Holy Spirit was connected with this occasion in Acts chapter 2. You go on a little bit more in Acts chapter 1, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, and we see that the Holy Spirit's coming was connected with his coming upon them and ultimately indwelling them and empowering them for the work that God had called them to do. Now, I think one of the things that we're going to see rather quickly as we look at this is that as we look at the text of Scripture, when we try to define what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is, one of the things I want us to understand is that if we were going to provide a definition, when we look through the New Testament, when we look through the book of Acts, we are going to see there are unique moments in redemptive history that are going to happen where the Holy Spirit comes upon certain groups. He comes upon the Jews there in Acts chapter 2. It's not said explicitly that the Samaritans in Acts chapter 8 spoke in tongues when the Holy Spirit came upon them, though I think it could be a reasonable inference to think that it did happen there. 
The Holy Spirit would come upon Gentiles in Acts chapter 10, and the Holy Spirit would come upon disciples of John the Baptist in Acts chapter 19. So you have these unique moments where the Jews, the apostles and other Jews, were seeing the Holy Spirit poured out upon these different groups, and they were given this explicit sign, at least in the case of the Gentiles, at least in the case of the disciples of John the Baptist, probably in the case of the Samaritans too, that these non-Jews were brought into God's covenant people without becoming Jews. More about that in a moment. And for these other groups, the Samaritans and the Gentiles and the disciples of John the Baptist, they saw that they received the Holy Spirit in conjunction with the presence of apostles being there. So they understood that they had to be under apostolic authority. It was part of God's plan for the church. Now, when you go through the New Testament, I think, and we'll unpack this a little bit more, I think a good definition of what the baptism of the Holy Spirit is, would be something like this. It is the one-time event, the one-time event, where God's people are brought into spiritual union with the Lord Jesus Christ. They are initially immersed with the Holy Spirit, and they are baptized into the body of Christ upon believing. As you go through the book of Acts, and you see this unique, these unique events happen in Redemptive history, I think that's the best way to understand what's happening when the baptism of the Holy Spirit happens subsequently in the lives of believers. That it is the consequence of the Holy Spirit's presence that believers are empowered. It is the occasion where people are permanently indwelt by the Holy Spirit, being initially indwelt by the Holy Spirit and immersed into the body of Christ upon conversion. That would become the normative reality for Christians. Now, let me unpack this a little bit more. One of the reasons why you know that the baptism of the Holy Spirit would become the normative reality for Christians at their conversion is that you never see it commanded in the Scriptures. You never see believers commanded to be baptized in the Holy Spirit or to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. You go through the book of Acts, you don't see that. You see people commanded to be baptized in water, You see that in Acts chapter 2, you see that in Acts chapter 10, but you don't see people being told, you need to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit, or you need to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. You just don't see it. You go through all of the New Testament epistles, and you don't see that command not one time. I think that's very important for us to understand. And the reason why you don't see that is because after different groups in the book of Acts receive the same outward witness that they were baptized with the Holy Spirit, it is something that happens to believers upon conversion. The Apostle Paul wrote to the church of Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, For also in one spirit we were all baptized into one body whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink one spirit. So through the Christian's initial baptism of the Holy Spirit upon conversion, they are baptized into the body of Christ. They share spiritual unity with all other believers regardless of their ethnicity. That's part of the language that Paul used in 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Whether Jews or Gentiles, there's unity. Regardless of socioeconomic status, whether slaves or free, there's unity. For in one spirit, we have all been baptized into one body. But again, just to say it again, with all the instruction in the New Testament, not one time do we see believers told, seek the baptism, i.e. the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Sadly, there are those who have thought that they have been lifted to another spiritual level because of an experience that they've had and they've defined as the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And as a consequence, at least in some cases, they've put themselves above the commands of God. Come under spiritual leadership? I'm above spiritual leadership. I've got the baptism. Do not forsake the assembling of yourselves with other saints. How could I assemble with them? They don't don't understand what I have experienced. I have the baptism. Think that women should not serve in the role of pastoral ministry because the scriptures explicitly forbid it very clearly. How could I say that? How could I come in agreement with that? She's got the baptism. Tell Christians 
that God has given them all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called them? As 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3 says, how could I say that? They need the baptism. You see the kind of problems that this could lead to? And it has led to that in many cases. And the problems just compound from there. And again, I am somebody, let me tell you, for those of you who don't know, I am somebody who became a Christian in a Pentecostal church. I am somebody who knows that there are dear, precious brothers and sisters who could be found in Pentecostal churches and Assembly of God churches. And I am thankful for my family that I'm going to spend forever with. Godly brothers and sisters. I am so thankful for them. I truly love them. My wife would bear you witness of that because I talk about how I appreciate my brethren that I've known from years back and still know in some cases and so on. But it doesn't change the fact that bad theology can lead to a lot of dangerous places. So think about it. If you have that kind of mindset, now you're going to be commanding people or encouraging people or nudging people to do something that God has never told them to do. Rather, it's something that God has already done to them. But now you start telling them to seek something that God's already granted to them and done in them. But the problems compound from there. Because if you start telling people to do something that the scripture doesn't command, you then, in many cases, will have to explain to them how to do what you're commanding them to do. Because somebody will say, you're telling me to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Well, I can't find a place in the scriptures where I'm told to do that. But how do I do that if I hear you and if I want to do what you're telling me to do? Then you begin to add an extra biblical description, an unbiblical description, of how to seek something that God never commanded people to seek. My cousin... Uh, Joey, who I've told you about before, he had, um, early on, after coming to know Christ, he was doing an evangelism ministry where he would go to different churches and he would uh, help those churches to be instructed, do a class on um, evangelism so that churches could know how to do evangelism using essentially the the way of the master um, method. So he was a part of the Assemblies of God at the time. And when he would go to different churches, he would have opportunities to speak with the pastors of those churches. And he told me how on one occasion he was speaking to a pastor of an Assembly of God church, Assemblies of God church, and that pastor had told him how he tries to help encourage his people to speak in tongues, to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit as they would believe as only evidenced by speaking in tongues. So this pastor told my cousin that what he does is that he tells the people to say the words, she bought a Honda, over and over again. You can imagine where that goes. She bought a Honda, she bought a Honda, she bought a Honda. Now, I hadn't seen anything like that in my time. But that's, where, that's what happens, because you try to figure out how to get people to get this thing, this, this amazing working happening in their life, and you make them think they have to prime the pump in some way to get the Holy Spirit to work. Now, in some cases, it's not going to be that. In some cases, it's going to be wait and pray. In some cases, it's going to be just loosen up your tongue. Just begin to praise. Loosen up your tongue. And the problems compound because you are encouraging people to do something that the Scripture hasn't commanded them to do, and you're giving them a prescription that the Scripture hasn't given them to follow. There are many problems. The problems with that are many. What was going on in Acts chapter 2 is that while the apostles were to wait in Jerusalem, along with the 120 who were gathered, them comprised altogether of about 120. This was a unique moment in redemptive history. And as we go through the New Testament, I'll say it one more time for now, we don't see Christians ever commanded to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Rather, I would argue it is a blessed reality that all Christians enjoy upon conversion when they are indwelt and initially immersed with the Holy Spirit, brought into union with the Lord Jesus Christ and other believers, having been baptized into his body. What we do see in the scriptures, however, is that believers are told to be continuously filled with the Holy Spirit. You can see that very explicitly in Ephesians 5.18. There, Christians are told, and do not be drunk with wine, which is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit. Implication of the language there, be continuously filled with the Holy Spirit. So now again, we want to step back. And we want to say, okay, if the baptism of the Holy Spirit is that one-time event 
that, a mo- that moment where Christians, upon their conversion, are initially immersed with the Holy Spirit, indwelt by the Holy Spirit, and are baptized into the body of Christ, having union with Christ and other believers, what then is the filling of the Holy Spirit? How should we understand that? I think when you look in Ephesians 5.18, you could begin to unpack it this way, that being filled with the Holy Spirit is explicitly connected with being under the influence of the Holy Spirit. You can see that very explicitly in Ephesians 5.18. Someone can be drunk with wine, filled with wine, and as a consequence, be influenced by wine, their behavior, their speech, their actions, all influenced by wine. And somebody can be filled with the Holy Spirit and have their behavior, their thoughts, their speech, their actions influenced by the Holy Spirit. Now we see this bear itself out in the verses that follow. If you were to ask, what does it look like? How do I know if somebody is filled with the Holy Spirit? Again, stick close to the scriptures. Ephesians 5.18, don't be drunk with wine, right? But be filled with the Holy Spirit. Well, what does it look like biblically to be filled with the Holy Spirit? Ephesians 5.18 is followed by verses 19, 20, and so on. Speaking to one another, this is verse 19, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So a person's speech is affected when they are filled with the Holy Spirit. A good barometer of how under the influence somebody is of the Holy Spirit is how they speak. How do they speak? A person who is filled with the Holy Spirit will speak in a way that honors God. They will start to sing. That's part of the picture that's painted here. They're going to start to sing. They're going to make melody in their hearts to the Lord. I can only imagine how beautiful that is to the Lord when God's people sing to Him. I think of one, one of the precious moments that I just get to enjoy on a rather regular basis is when Thea comes up to me and sings a song to me about me. When she says, I love my daddy. He is so special and cute to me. It's precious. Brother or sister, let me just encourage you. Sing to the Lord. If it's precious to me, a creature, how much more precious is it to our Heavenly Father? who's loved us from before the foundation of the world. Sing to him. Make up your own melody. You don't have to put it on the radio. We don't have to hear it here. Just make it up. Sing to him. Tell him how much you love him. Tell him how much you appreciate him. That's a witness of you being filled with, under the influence of, the Holy Spirit. As you go on, you could see that somebody who's filled with the Holy Spirit, just kind of walking this out contextually, you would see that people who are filled with the Holy Spirit are going to show that in the relationships that they have. Within the church, there'll be godly submission to one another in reverence and in the fear of God. You can see that wives will submit to the leadership of their husbands and they will respect their husbands. So if you had a wife who's saying, I'm filled with the Holy Spirit because I had such and such an experience, but she's not submitting to the leadership of her husband, then you would say you look like, you're acting like you're under the influence of the flesh as opposed to the Holy Spirit. Husbands. Loving their wives, laying down their lives for their wives, loving their wives, godly, in a godly way, leading their wives, providing for their wives, and so on, is an outworking of them being under the influence of the Holy Spirit. The examples go on. Children who obey their parents. It's an example of walking in the Spirit. Of course, it could be if somebody is a child and is filled with the Holy Spirit as somebody who is a believer. To use... Uh, modern day language to apply to the language of bond servants um, and masters. A Christian employee who doesn't serve only with eye service, but does his work or her work as unto the Lord, is walking out a life in step with the Holy Spirit. They're under the influence of the Holy Spirit. An employer, to use language in our modern day context as opposed to a master, who treats his employees with respect and dignity and without threatening is such a one that is acting in accordance with the leading and the guiding of the Holy Spirit. So that's one of the ways you can know if somebody is filled with the Holy Spirit. I think it's important to know that if somebody's filled with the Holy Spirit contextually, it's going to play itself out in the concentric circles of the relationships of your life. So if somebody is 
thinking they're filled with the Holy Spirit, but their relationships within the marriage and their acting out their proper role as husband and wife or as a father and so on is not in a proper place, well, it's implicitly showing that somebody is under the influence of the flesh more than the Holy Spirit, at least in those regards. Now, if someone were to ask this question, how can I be filled with the Holy Spirit? Because that's a good question. It's a command. That is a command. Be baptized in the Holy Spirit, not a command. That's something that God does upon conversion in the life of a believer. But we are told, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So a good question would be, how then can I be filled with the Holy Spirit? Well, one of the implications that you just saw is that as you walk under the submission of the Holy, uh, to the Holy Spirit, as you're under the influence of the Holy Spirit, it's an outworking of you being filled with the Holy Spirit. So that, I would argue, is definitely connected to the answer to that question. But I also think, if you were to ask the question, how can I be filled with the Holy Spirit, one of the answers to that question can be found in the parallel passage to Ephesians 5, chapter 5, verses 18 and 19, found in Colossians 3, 16. Okay, so listen again to Ephesians 5, 18 and 19. See how being filled with the Holy Spirit is apparently paralleled with what we read in Colossians 3.16 in a moment. So again, Ephesians 5.18, And do not be drunk with wine, in which is dissipation, but be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So in Ephesians 5.18, we're told, be filled with the Holy Spirit, and these things will happen. You'll be singing. Psalms, hymns, spiritual songs, and so on. You'll be giving thanks to the Lord. In Colossians 3.16, we are told, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another, in, watch, just about the same language with a little bit of nuance, in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. This is why I would say, that letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly, that word that was inspired by the Holy Spirit as the writers of the New Testament penned what they penned and so on, is a way in which you could be filled with the Holy Spirit. As the word of Christ dwells in you richly in all wisdom, and as you by the grace of God submit to it and are under its influence, it is biblically akin to being filled with and under the influence of the Holy Spirit. So you say, how could I be filled with the Holy Spirit? Ephesians 5.18, be filled with the Holy Spirit and these things will happen that follow. Parallel text, Colossians 3.16, doesn't say be filled with the Holy Spirit. It says let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, which tells me a means of being filled with the Holy Spirit is letting the word of Christ, the Spirit-inspired text of Scripture, dwell in your heart and mind and as you submit to it, you're under the influence of it. Now, furthermore, if you say, how can I be filled with the Holy Spirit? You look at what happens a little bit later on in the book of Acts, and you get a little bit of a paradigm. You see that in Acts chapter 4, the apostles are praying. They're praying for boldness. And they're filled afresh with the Holy Spirit, we see in Acts chapter 4, and they would speak the word of God with boldness. So there's prayer. They're praying in that moment, Lord, help us to speak your word with boldness. They had just been persecuted to a degree. They would be persecuted to a greater degree, not too long after. Um, and they're praying for boldness. Peter and John had been initially persecuted and warned, but then not too long after that, they all would be. So I would say as you pray, as you pray to be helped by God so that you might be joyful amidst your trying circumstances, as you pray for boldness, as you pray for wisdom, it's a means by which God will fill you afresh with his joy and his wisdom, his peace, and so on, which come from the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Furthermore, I would say, if you were to pray to better understand, or pray for others to better understand, the heights and the depth and the breadth and the width of the love of Christ, which surpasses knowledge, we're told that that leads to one being filled with the fullness of God. Ephesians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19. So those are some ways you can pursue being filled with under the influence of the Holy Spirit. Last point with regards to this. I'll make this point briefly, but again, I think it'll help you understand what is meant by being filled with the Holy Spirit. Just to go through some examples in the Gospel of Luke and the book of Acts, I want you to see that to be filled with something is at least 
at that given moment to be heaven, he heavily under the influence of, to some degree even dominated by, whatever that thing is. Watch these examples. When Jesus spoke at the synagogue in Nazareth in Luke chapter 4, those in Nazareth heard him speak and they were filled with wrath or rage. Luke chapter 4 verse 28. So they were filled with wrath and rage and then they were under the influence of that wrath and rage. In the very next verse we're told they rose up and they thrust Jesus out of the city and they wanted to throw him over the cliff. See what it's like to be filled with something? You're under the influence of something and thus you're dominated to some degree by that thing. More examples. When the scribes and the Pharisees saw Jesus heal on the Sabbath, they were filled with rage. And then what did they do? Luke chapter 6, verse 11. They discussed with one another what they might do to Jesus. Acts chapter 5, verse 3. Peter asked Ananias, Ananias, why has Satan filled your heart? To do what? To lie to the Holy Spirit. Filled with a certain thing, as it were, and then influenced by it to do a certain thing. The high priest and those who were with him, the sect of the Sadducees, they were filled with indignation or jealousy, and they laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. Acts chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. So they're filled with indignation or jealousy, and what did they do? They act on it. They were dominated by, they were under the influence of indignation and jealousy. Now you'll see examples in the New Testament, book of Acts, as you go through, when a person is filled with the Holy Spirit, it's connected with bold speech about Christ, or first century miracles of the apostles, or those like Stephen. Stephen, for instance, was full of the Holy Spirit when he bore witness to the truth of Christ, when he bore witness to the truth of the Scriptures and then the truth of Christ to those who would ultimately martyr him. See, the point of providing these references is to help you understand what is meant by being filled with the Holy Spirit. If a person is filled with something, envy, wrath, joy, there's more examples that could be given, that something becomes the dominant thing in a person's behavior. So to be filled with the Holy Spirit is connected with having the Holy Spirit, the person of the Holy Spirit, be the dominant factor in your behavior. You're so filled with him. You're under the influence of him. You have the word of Christ dwelling in you richly, the spirit-inspired text of scripture, and it's being impressed upon your heart, and it is directing your actions, the word of God and the person of the Holy Spirit. Back to Acts chapter 2, verse 4. Now, on the day of Pentecost, we're told that the 120 or so in the upper room were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now notice the language. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Again, all of them. It wasn't just one of them, nor was it some of them. It was all of them. And this is an amazing moment in redemptive history. If you go through the Old Testament, you would see moments like Exodus chapter 40, verse 35, where the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Or you would see these amazing moments. There's more than one recorded in Scripture, uh, or it's recorded more than one time in the Scripture. 1 Kings chapter 8, verse 11, for instance, when the glory of God filled the temple. Now, in the new covenant, the people of God have become the temple of the living God. And so what is God doing? He's doing what he has done throughout redemptive history. He's filling his tabernacle or his temple but now, under the new covenant, his people are his temple. So anyone who is a Christian is the temple of the living God. It's a living stone that comprises that temple. And God's Holy Spirit fills that temple. Amazing. And when this happened, they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So they were empowered. They're under the influence of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is so empowering them in this supernatural way that this supernatural sign begins to happen. They begin to speak in known languages. That's very clear as you go on in this account. 
known languages. They didn't know the languages or the dialects, but those Jews who were gathered from the different places where the Jews had been dispersed, they knew those languages. And they heard the 120 or so speaking miraculously in languages that they didn't know, but that the people who heard them knew. This was a miraculous sign. It was an amazing work of God. Now, if you were to ask, okay, why is this happening? Why is God having them speak? Now, again, I use the word tongues, but again, it's other languages, right? You'll nuance it as you go through dialects, dialectos, and so on. We'll talk a bit more about that, Lord willing, next week. Why is God having this happen? Well, Lord willing, next week, we'll look a little bit more at the immediate context, but I will tell you this so far that as the 120 or so make their way out of the upper room, and as these Jews begin to hear the wonderful works of God in their own native tongues, it, A, captures their attention. Now they're wondering what's going on. What, What could be meant by this? They're hearing the wonderful works of God in their own languages, so this would kind of clue them into the fact that this is an actual work of God. I would argue that it was a divine witness to the truthfulness of the proclamation of the gospel that Peter was about to make. This was a sign that what's happening here is of God. And we know it's of God because they're praising God. They're speaking the wonderful works of God. So we don't have a reason to doubt that this is of God. And then all of a sudden, Peter will stand up and explain what this is. God's pouring out his spirit on all of his covenant people. And let me tell you about Jesus the Christ, whom you crucified. So that's what's happening in the immediate context. We'll talk about that a little bit more, Lord willing, next week. But I want you to know, and I'll explain this now. Please do not make the mistake of thinking that Acts chapter 2, verse 4 is meant to teach Christians that in order for them to know that they have been filled with the Holy Spirit, that they have to speak in tongues, to speak in other known languages. It's just, it's not what's going on here at all. It's not what's going on in the book of Acts. It's not what's taught in the rest of the New Testament. Let me just explain that to you so you have a resource to go by to understand what's actually happening here with the speaking in tongues. As you go through the book of Acts, this is what you will see. That speaking in tongues was a verifiable sign showing that God poured out his Holy Spirit on different groups thus laying groundwork for unity and spiritual equality in the New Testament church. That's what's happening. You have these Jews who have the Holy Spirit poured out upon them, and the external sign, at least one of them, there was fire resting upon them, but the external sign that they had was the speaking in tongues, other languages. Now, the clearest example of what I had just mentioned to you is seen in the Gentiles in Acts chapter 10 and the commentary that follows in Acts chapter 11 and 15. What I want to show you is that when you look through the book of Acts, you're going to see how the speaking in tongues is to be understood. What is it meant to communicate? And I'm arguing very clearly, very clearly, it's meant to be an external sign that God was bringing other groups, Samaritans, Gentiles, disciples of John the Baptist, into the New Covenant community as fully-fledged members of the New Covenant community without having to become Jewish. I want to look at Acts chapter 10. In Acts chapter 10, when Cornelius and the Gentiles there are given the Holy Spirit, they spoke with tongues and they magnified God. Now this was astounding. As a matter of fact, for those who were with Peter... Those of the circumcision who believed, Peter, by the way, he brought with him six other believing Jews who were of the circumcision. They go with Peter, and they're astonished. And you're like, why are they so astonished? The text tells us, Acts chapter 10, verse 45, that they were astonished because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles. How did they know the Holy Spirit had been poured out upon the Gentiles? Because those Gentiles who initially received the Holy Spirit received the external sign that they themselves had received. They spoke in other languages. Peter then said in Acts chapter 10, verse 47, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized? 
who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And you would think, Peter, why would you forbid water? But you're forgetting of how radical it was in that first century context for these Gentiles to receive the Holy Spirit and to be welcomed into, into the new covenant community without having become themselves Jews. It was so radical. In fact, Peter went back up to Jerusalem in the following chapter, and those of the circumcision contended with him, saying, you went into uncircumcised men and ate with them, Acts chapter 11, verse 3. Peter told them about his vision, about, Corn about his vision, about Cornelius' vision, and how they, the Gentiles, received the Holy Spirit even as the Jews had, saying this, if then God has given to them the same gift as also to us, having believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, how was I able to forbid God? See, he's saying the tongues that they spoke in was a sign that I couldn't resist the will of God. They were to be welcomed into the new covenant community. The Gentiles were filled with the Holy Spirit. They were verifiable Christians without becoming Jews. And those at Jerusalem became silent when they heard these things. They glorified God and said, Then God has also granted to the Gentiles repentance to life. Acts chapter 11, verse 18. Now there's more, there's more evidence to this. Peter would affirm this at the Jerusalem council when he said, speaking of the Gentiles, God acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us and made no distinctions between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. So tongues were not meant to be an ongoing sign through which believers would know that they were baptized with the Holy Spirit. Rather, it would be the means through which Jewish believers, including the apostles, would know that other groups were as much Christian as they were. The Jews spoke in tongues. The Samaritans were filled with the Holy Spirit. And although the text does not say, they likely did speak in tongues. The Gentiles spoke with tongues. And the disciples of John the Baptist spoke in tongues. Thus, I would tell you, appreciate what Pentecost points to. All believers receive the Holy Spirit, are immersed by the Holy Spirit, baptized into the body of Christ. And although I love my Pentecostal brethren who believe the word of God and the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, it is thoroughly unbiblical when Pentecostal churches or Assemblies of God churches teach that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is a special filling that happens subsequent to salvation and is only evidenced by the speaking in tongues because A, that's not what's being taught at all in the book of Acts. Not at all. In Acts chapter 2, it was a miraculous witness to Peter's forthcoming sermon, and it would be an external witness that different groups were fully a part of the new covenant people of God without becoming Jews. And B, when you go through the entire New Testament, we have detailed instructions on a lot of different things. How to choose elders, how to choose deacons, how qualifying widows should be treated, and so on. But we don't see any instruction to seek the baptism of the Holy Spirit or that it's only evidence in speaking in tongues. Rather, as a matter of fact, point C, we are told that we have all been baptized with the Holy Spirit, in the Spirit, into the body of Christ, and all do not speak in tongues. 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13. I read it earlier. I'll read it again. For also in one Spirit... We were all baptized into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, and we were all made to drink one spirit. Now, a little bit later on, in that first century context, Peter asks, or Paul asks, do all speak in tongues? And the anticipated answer is no. You put verse 13 and verse 30 together, or 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and you get something like this. In one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, and all do not speak in tongues. So some of the reasons uh, why this kind of teaching that says, no, you have to seek it now, you have to get it now, even though you've been a believer for however long, and it has to be evidence in speaking in tongues, one of the reasons why this teaching is dangerous is because it creates an unbiblical occasion for pride. It's never a biblical occasion for pride. <laughs> it's only biblical occasions for hum humility, but it creates um, an occasion for pride. And then it also can create a sense of spiritual inadequacy for others. 
those who perceive themselves to have spoken in tongues and are now part of in a group of elite Christians, you know, those who have been elevated to another level in ministry, they've gone up a notch, they are truly empowered. Other Christians are not living in the fullness of the blessing they could experience. Now, they could be doing a lot of things well. They could be living godly lives. They could be godly husbands who truly love their wives and serve them well. They could be godly women who submit to their husbands, are dutiful in the, in the rearing up of their children, walking in purity, and so on. They could be parents who are protecting their children from worldliness, pouring the truth of God into them, protecting them from sexual immorality, and so on. They could be all of these things, but if they are not qualified in this Pentecostal schematic of having been taken to the next level, they're just second tier. All of that's good, but imagine what it could be. They're working with a proverbial four-cylinder engine when they could have an eight-cylinder engine. Now, for some, if they actually believe this and they, and they don't have something that they would qualify as this experience, they live with a sense of inadequacy. You know, my other brethren keep telling me that, you know, I need to seek it more. I need to pray more. Just keep waiting. I'm doing all these other things. I'm trying to love others. But for some reason, God does not want to give me this gift. What's wrong with me? And why is he giving it to them? Because I'm told that everybody can have it if they want it. So now you create two tiers. When the whole point of Pentecost is to create great unity, they all, all the people of God have the Holy Spirit. God fills his new covenant temple with his presence. That's the point of Pentecost. It's crazy to me, crazy to think you take Pentecost and a primary point of Pentecost is unity of the Holy Spirit and all the people of God and you create division through it. That is dangerous, dangerous. In some cases, and again, and this, this won't be everybody, but if somebody, if somebody buys into this, um, instead of a regular intaking of truth and applying it to their lives, Oftentimes, such ones will end up chasing experiences. The life-giving, soul-nourishing, living and active word of God can be treated as a dead letter because they want more experiences. That is a wicked way of thinking and even speaking about the word of God. The word of God is living and active, powerful, it begets new life in the believer through the regeneration of the Holy Spirit. Then it nourishes the new life that it begets. A constant chasing of experiences can help someone to be derelict in the duties that are right before them. Right before them. Love your wife. Serve your church. Be under spiritual leadership. Protect your children. You don't need to chase experiences. Just live the Christian life and you'll have beautiful, amazing, sometimes trying experiences. So I want to close today by reminding you, brethren, that you have been endued with power from on high. The new covenant reality for you who are in Christ Jesus is here. It has happened. You have been endued with power from on high. You are not living the Christian life with some lack of ability or power. God has given to you all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who has called you. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 3. If you didn't have the Holy Spirit in your life, you'd be in big trouble as a Christian. You wouldn't be a Christian. Yeah, Romans chapter 8, verse 9, if anyone does not have the Spirit of God, they're not. They do not belong to God. But you'd be in big trouble, even if you wanted to live the Christian life, which you wouldn't want to. You'd be like Samson trying to fight Philistines without the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. To borrow some illustrations that have been used in church history, uh, you could see without, you couldn't see without eyes, and you couldn't hear without ears, and you couldn't breathe without lungs, and you cannot live the Christian life without the presence and empowerment of the Holy Spirit. But you who are in Christ are not without this power. You have the power in the person of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And when I say power, what do I mean? Well, here are some for instances. You have power unto holiness even when it's hard. You have power via the person of the Holy Spirit to love when the flesh, the world, and the devil would encourage you to hate. You have power via the person and the presence of the Holy Spirit to work towards unity in the local church as opposed to when the flesh would want to fracture. You have power. Power unto peace, 
when the reasons to worry line up before your mind to make their case. Power to be consistent when it's costly as opposed to inconsistent because it's easy. Power unto boldness when quietness is the easier alternative. You have been endued with power from on high. Embrace the new covenant reality and be continuously filled with the Holy Spirit. Be under the Spirit's influence. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. Let it direct you. Let the Holy Spirit apply it to you. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Let the Holy Spirit dominate you even as the word of God is applied to you in your life. May your speech, may your actions, and by the grace of God, even your thoughts all be under the influence of the word of God and the Spirit of God. Because you, son or daughter of the living God, have had the Holy Spirit poured out upon you. So now walk in the Spirit and be continuously filled with the Spirit. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this amazing new covenant reality that your Holy Spirit has been poured out upon all flesh, i.e. all of your covenant people, young and old, men servants and maid servants and so on, sons and daughters, hallelujah. Father, we pray, Lord, that you might lead many people, many believers who currently are mired in a wrong thinking as it relates to this, living with some sense of pride or inadequacy, and that you might lead so many to yourself, Lord, in that closer way to understand what you have taught in your word concerning the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Father, we pray that we, by your grace, would be filled with the Holy Spirit, walking in humility, not thinking of ourselves more highly than we ought to think, walking in love and in peace and in joy and in patience and kindness and gentleness and goodness and self-control, all by your grace, all being under the influence of the Holy Spirit. That afresh today we might leave here desiring to drink in the Word of God and having our mouths be affected so that we speak to one another in such a way that honors you, that we sing to you in a way that glorifies you, and that in the different relationships of our lives, we show ourselves to be under your influence. Thank you for this word, Lord. Thank you for the living word which you use to renew our minds and inflame our hearts. And may it be so today, we ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.